Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Din and Daf. This is Alana Steinhain, and I am excited to be recording from Yerushalayim. Our topic this week relates to something that comes up in Baba Batra, Daf Gimel, and also Daf Chet, namely the mitzvah of redeeming captives of Pedion Shvuyim. Um, obviously, at the time that I'm recording this, which is the summer of 2024, um, that is a very live issue and a very personal issue. Uh, for many, many, many people. And Bezrat Hashem, I hope that it should be resolved soon and in the best way possible. And I would like to offer this shir in the zechut of all of those who are still held captive. Uh, may they be returned to their families swiftly and in the best condition possible. So redeeming captives as a mitzvah, what's very interesting about the presentation at the beginning of Baba Batra is the fact that it seems to be a very public mitzvah. So for example, we get on Daf Gimel already, Gimel Amad Bet, where Rav Chista is talking about, you know, if you are going to be building a new shul, you shouldn't tear down your old shul until the new one is built. And one of the reasons is that you might actually have to use the funding that you've raised for the new shul to do Pidyon Shpuyim, right? So Pidyon Shpuyim does not appear as a private mitzvah for a private individual, which by the way, is different than the way that Pidyon Shpuyim is presented in Masachet Ketubot between a husband and a wife, where it's a personal private responsibility of a husband should God forbid his wife get taken. It's a personal private responsibility for him to do Pidyon Shpuyim for her. But here in Baba Batra, the description is of a mitzvah that is mutelet ala tzibur, a mitzvah that is the community's responsibility, so much so that the money that they would have used to build a, a, a Beit Knesset, they would have to use for this. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, there were kupot, there were actual funds, communal funds set aside because people were often uh, taken captive and they were uh, held for ransom. The other thing that happens at the beginning of Baba Batra is that we find out the reason why uh, Pidyon Shvuyim is described as a mitzvah rabbah, as a great mitzvah, or the way that the Rambam puts it, um, and this is all in the source sheet, but we're not going to look at the source sheet yet, but the, the way that the Rambam puts it, Ein lecha mitzvah gedola ke Pidyon Shvuyim, or Ein Lecha Mitzvah Rabba Kepedion Shuyim. There is no mitzvah that is as great as redeeming captives. And the reason why the Gemara tells us is because when somebody is in captivity, any of the things that could possibly befall a person, whether it's natural death, whether it is death by cherev, whether it, meaning death by the sword, whether it is death by rav, by famine, um, we don't know any of these things and more uh, could happen to somebody when they are a uh, chatuf or a chatufa, right? When when they are captive. And therefore, this is really a mitzvah rabbah. Now, what I want to deal with today are the different places where Chazal talk about the mitzvah of pidyon shvuyim, because as is always the case um, with halacha, there are parameters around when how much you can spend on Pidyon Shvuyim. And I want to make the following two caveats before we begin. Caveat number one is the Pidyon Shvuyim that Chazal are talking about seems to be a case where a person may be in danger of, certainly if she's female, she may be in danger of being raped, but for the most part, she is not in danger of being killed necessarily. Some of the assumptions um, that we have today and can understand today, some of those assumptions are not quite the same, even as the Gemara had said, anything's possible to happen when somebody is in Chevy, when somebody is being held captive. Nonetheless, it was often sort of a tool to make money, right? People would capture Jews, ransom them uh, to the Jewish community and make money that way. So we should be aware of that. The second thing is, I would say, the discussion in the Gemara revolves around how much money should you give to redeem Jewish captives. And of course, now today that has changed as well, because generally speaking, we're not talking about a monetary amount. We're talking about 
certainly in the case of Israel, we're talking about letting dangerous prisoners out of jail, letting dangerous Palestinian prisoners out of jail. And so how do the costs line up? So the way I'm going to do this is actually, I'm going to go with you through some of the um, examples in the Gemara about Pidyon Shvuyim. And then I left for you on the source sheet, everything translated into English, some contemporary conversation in modern Israel about these issues and about particular um, agreements of Pidyon Shvuyim, essentially, over the years. And you're welcome to read those on your own, but they very much come from the spirit of the way the Gemara and ultimately the Rishonim are going to try to navigate the questions of what are the parameters around Pidyon Shvuyim. So I'm going to share my screen so that we can look at what I think is sort of the ground zero um, of the discussion of Pidyon Shvuyim, certainly the public type of Pidyon Shvuyim, which is in Gitin. I just want to make sure that I have the right one for you. Okay, Yofi, let's start. No, I have the wrong one. Let's try that again. Always keep it interesting, right? Get there in a minute. Okay. Yofi. So this is what we have. We have our Gemarot in uh, Baba Batra. That's one and two. Then you have the Rambam saying there's no greater mitzvah. Then you have the Shulchan Aruch saying. That any minute that we waste not uh, redeeming captives, if we can, we are as though shedding blood ourselves, God forbid. So you can tell already that, you know, the question of danger, it's always lurking in the background here. Okay, but there was a possibility of getting captives just for money back then. So let's look at the mission in Gittin. That's number five here on your sheet. As you see, I gave you much more than I usually do that you can read on your own because it's such an important and burning issue, um, at least at the time of this recording, that I think it's important for people to have as many resources as they can. So the Mishnah says, We don't redeem captives, meaning using money. We don't redeem captives for more than their monetary value, which I guess would be, you know, chas v'shalom, a sort of slave trade kind of, how do you figure out someone's monetary value, right? But we don't redeem them for more for the sake of tikkun olam, for the sake of establishing the world. Now, what do we mean by that? Meaning it sounds like we would want to redeem them for more, but we don't because of something that clearly is like an affirming important value. So the Gemara says, Ibailahu, you know, the question was, when the Mishnah says, for the sake of the establishment of the world, right? Like we do this in order to establish the world, we put a cap on how much you can spend to save Shvuyim, to save captives. Is this Mishum Dukha Ditziburahu? Is this because we don't want the community to have to bear too much of a cost, meaning it's going to bankrupt the community, which you know, already leaves open the possibility that if there's somebody who's very wealthy who can afford it and it's no problem, or even if it comes from somebody's own funds, right, that it would be fine. Odilma, or maybe it's Mishum Dilo Ligrivu Belaitu Tve. Or maybe we say don't pay more because what's going to end up happening is it's going to incentivize taking more captives, right? So this is the basic question, right? The Gemara Gittin says very matter-of-factly, you're not going to pay more than the value of the Shvuyim, right? Because of Tikkun Olam. And the Gemara asks, well, are we talking about we've Tikkun Olam, we don't want to bankrupt the community, in which case you could imagine what the uh, outliers might be. Someone wealthy, a family member who's wealthy, an individual who comes forth and is willing to do, Odilma, maybe it's, we're worried that this is going to incentivize. Now, I want to say that it's also worthwhile to think about what the outliers might be here too. The exceptions might be here too. Is there a situation in which no incentivization is needed or they already have incentive and you paying more 
actually doesn't change the incentive one way or another. Is it possible that that may be the case, right? So these, you can already see that I'm trying to push us in the direction of thinking what might be the exceptions to this, because as soon as a, a rule is laid down, all the white space around it, the exceptions begin to emerge. So it's interesting to note, you know, Rashi spends time saying, you know, according to the side that says it's about not making the community spend too much. If they have somebody, a relative who's wealthy, they can take care of it. Rambam in number seven says, I, I hold by the incentivization theory. I don't want that to necessarily be the case. And toast food, by the way, taking off of the fact that a man is uh, allowed to redeem his wife and should redeem his wife even for too much money, Tosfo taking off of that says, if a person can pay for it themselves, no matter what the reason is, if you can take it from the bank account of the individual who was captured, you can do that because ishtoki gufo, just like a man is allowed to redeem his wife for more money than it's worth, so too a person can redeem themselves for more money than it's worth. That's just, you know, the Rishonim starting to think about how do we put all these things together, right? How do we put the fact that it's a mitzvah rabah, the fact that the Mishnah says don't pay too much, the fact that the Ketubot says a husband has to redeem his wife, how do we put it all together? But what I think is actually most interesting is an agadita, a halachic narrative that comes up related to pidyon shvuyim, where it's very clear that somebody was podeh a shavui they redeemed a captive for more than they're worth. So Tanu Rabbanan, the Gemarian Gittin, Nun Chet Amad Aleph. Tanu Rabbanan, Maaseb Rabbi Yoshua ben Chananya, Shalach Likrach Gadol Shabiromi. Happened Rabbi Yoshua ben Chananya went to a great town in Rome. Amrulo, and they said to him, you know, he heard the following, Tinoke Chad Yesh Bevet Asurim, there is a young man, a, a child really, who's in, I guess you might think maybe a toddler, a young kid, who's in jail, meaning the Romans put him in jail. He's a beautiful child with curly hair and beautiful eyes. So Rabbi Yishu ben Hanania goes and stands at the opening of the jail. Amar, and he says, he actually starts a pasuk. He says, Minatan Mishisa Yaakov Israel Vozazim. Who gave Yaakov over for spoil and Yisrael over to robbers? Which is the beginning of a Pasuk in Yeshayahu. And what happens? The kid who everyone was talking about from that Beta Asurim, who's in jail, continues the verse. Anna Oto Tinok, the kid calls out from behind the bars, Va'amar and says, Hello, Hashem, zu chatanu lo, velo avu vidrachav, haloch velo sham u bitarato. Didn't, wasn't it God? Isn't it God who gave us over for spoil? Because we've sinned against God, we didn't walk in God's ways, and we weren't obedient to God's laws. Continuation of Yeshayahu. So what's clear is not only is this child beautiful, but this child is a Torah learner. This child knows Torah. And so what does Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah say? Amar, he says, Muftachni, Muftachani, excuse me, Bo, Shemoreh Rabbi Yisrael. I am sure that this kid could end up being a teacher of halacha, a posik in Israel. Ha'avoda, I swear, that's a terminology of swearing. Like I swear on the Beit HaMikdash, which obviously is very prescient in the time when Rabbi Yeshua ben Hananiah and Rome and kind of, that's when everything is in danger. He says, I swear, I swear that I'm not leaving here until I redeem him with any amount of money that they ask. Amru, they said about this situation, Indeed, he did not leave. Rabbi Shubhan Hananiah did not leave until he redeemed this person with a lot of money. And in fact, this person did become a posek. This person did become somebody who was a rabbi in Israel. And who was he? Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, right? Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha, 
who we hear from all the time in Sifrut Chazal, all the time in rabbinic literature, he was the one who was saved. Now you look at this and you say, wait a second, but I thought we had a Mishnah that says you can't save people for more than their worth, right? Now it could be, we might say, well, what we're talking about here is maybe it's according to the opinion that it's because we don't want to bankrupt the community. Maybe somehow Rabbi Yoshua ben Hananiah was able to come into money. I'm not quite sure, but certainly on the side of isn't this going to incentivize people to take more captives, the Romans to take more captives? Look at what Tosfot say. They say, no, actually, that's not our chief concern. Our chief concern is something else. I keep going to the wrong share. This is what happens when you have too many things open on your computer, which is also a metaphor. We know this, okay? So Tosvot in Gittin on that same Amud, right? Tosvot in Gittin say, here we go. This is exactly what you need. Well, yeah, yeah, I am so sorry for people who are watching this that it's like back and forth, back and forth. I'm actually using someone else's computer. That's why this is happening. I'm just not used to the whole thing. So Tosvot say, Koma Moncha Poskinalav, he was willing to pay all, anything that they asked. When there is danger to someone's life, we definitely redeem captives for more than they're worth. And then Tosvo will give another possibility, which is maybe this kid as a prodigy is an exception of his own. Inami, or maybe Mishum de Muflag Mahava, Ahaya, because he was a very he was a prodigy, so maybe that's the reason, right? So we have two different categories of exception that have been added here. One category is if there is danger to somebody's life. And another category is there may be certain people who definitely need to be saved. Now, it's, you know, obviously difficult to think about that latter uh, perspective of there are definitely people who need to be saved. But I do think that some of this logic, right, whether it's, the worry about danger, sakanat nefashot, or the, we need to save these people because they need to be saved, right? Like it is a very high priority for us to save them. I think that actually morphs into not just, oh, somebody who's a Torah scholar who's going to be able to bring every everybody um, uh, uh, like continuity of the Jewish people and of Torah, but it also ends up in, in the recent, in the contemporary conversation, like applying to chayalim, which is like, you can't send somebody to do a job to, to protect the Jewish people, to protect the state of Israel and not rescue them when they, God forbid, get taken. And I do wonder when I think about the civilians who were taken from the South on October 7th, I do think about the question of, is it possible that the responsibility to save your citizens it's it sort of ends it ends up in this category of these people are kind of essential for the possibility of the continuity of the Jewish state. The top priority has to be Jewish continuity, and what does it mean to have a state of Israel where people can be, God forbid, uh, uh, taken captive and they're not returned? Right. So just thinking about how these categories end up being parallel to some of the conversations. Now the Ramban, the Ramban has a different. Um, reason for this exception, right? He's also trying to figure out why is it that um, the Ramban um, in Gittin and Daf Memhe, the Ramban says, well, actually, I think there's a different reason here. It says, V'yesh Lomar, number 10, Bishat Chorban, it was at the time of the destruction. He wasn't worried about them looking to take more, the Romans taking more captives. Because they were already all captives. Right? So he says, if you can remove the incentive piece, then pay as much as you want. We're already all captives. Now, the conversation today 
and you'll see it when you look at the contemporary discussion, there are those who say, what incentive do Palestinian terror organizations have to take captives? It's not just the incentive of who are the prisoners that they're going to get in return. It's also just the sikhsukh, it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And until you find a remedy to that conflict, be it legal or otherwise, you're not going to be able, in, 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 there's always, quote unquote, an incentive, Rahman al -Islan. There's always an incentive. So is the prisoner swap doing anything to add to that sense of incentive? It's a very interesting question because I think you can then go even deeper and say, is a certain number of the prisoner swap doing something for the incentive, right? If we're willing to give three prisoners, is that less incentivizing than if you're willing to give a thousand prisoners, let's say? It's very, the whole thing is very, very complicated. Then the Ramban adds two, two answers that we've already seen, right? Inami Rabbi Yeshua David Lagarme who David, maybe Rabbi Yeshua is acting on his own, he's using his own money, right? That's fine. And then the Yeshua just on the next line, and somebody might say, if there's ever a chashash, there's ever a suspicion, a danger of death, right? You should save them with any money you have. But then the Ramban says, the lomista bear that doesn't that that perspective doesn't make sense to me as an exception to call Shevi Kula Bay because there's always that danger in a situation of somebody who's being held captive. Although, as I mentioned before, there were definitely times in which it was more likely that somebody was taking a Jew as a captive for ransom than that they were necessarily um, interested in uh, mortally wounding them. But I will say that the chashash of ones, the chashash of rape, has been there from the beginning, right? The conversations in the Gemara, you can see this in the first parak of Ketubot, conversations in, in the Gemara about women coming back from captivity and the concern that if they had been raped by somebody who is not Jewish, that they would no longer be allowed to marry a Kohen because they're not considered in the proper status, right? So that's always been there. But suffice it to say, what we have here is we have a situation in which, on the one hand, we see from the Gemara that this is a mitzvah rabbah. It's a great mitzvah. We see from the Gemara that this is a mitzvah that takes public funds. And then we see, on the other hand, that this is a mitzvah that the Mishnah suggests has parameters. Why does it have parameters? Because of the danger to a community, they'll go bankrupt. Or maybe we would say it today, instead of going bankrupt, we might say the community may become unsafe because of the prisoner swap, or perhaps because of incentivizing uh, further captivity. And what we saw is that within Shas, there is at least one example, besides for a husband redeeming his wife, there is at least one example where somebody goes and redeems for more than the amount. And all the different explanations that are given why that is okay, whether they're doing it for themselves, meaning of their own money, whether they're doing it because actually when we are pretty certain that the person could die, right, we have to save them for quote unquote more than they're worth, or because this is a particular situation of Jewish continuity and this little boy, Rabbi Shmuel ben Elisha, was somebody who would contribute to Jewish continuity. And how do we actually parallel that today, right? Um, in terms of who should be saved and when, um, or if there's a situation where there's, it's, you know, they don't need, there's no incentivizing for the Ramban's case, there's no incentivizing because they already took captives, but maybe in the case of the state of Israel, the incentive is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it, it, or I should really say the incentive is the... <laughs> Hamas charter to destroy Israel. I shouldn't say it in such a balanced way, um, but it, it, it's it's not necessarily about what works and what doesn't work. It's just about wreaking havoc and creating chaos. So what I'll say is I would encourage you to take a look at Roman numeral three, 
where I give you different approaches and different perspectives on the question of redeeming captives at what cost. And I think it's incredibly powerful to see that the conversation that happens there revolves around almost in every instance, attempting to find justifications for saving captives at any cost. Those justifications may be, we can't send chayalim out and not save them. They are an extension of ourself. And just like a husband can pay more for a wife, a person can pay more for themselves. They are an extension of who we are, right? And now we would have to say, civilians are an extension of who we are. Sakanat nefashot, the danger that people are in. The question of what actually incentivizes or is the incentive there, whether we play a part or not. I think it's really, really significant to see. And especially in the case of Rav Shlomo Goren, he actually changed his opinion once Shuyim were redeemed. He wrote an addendum to his opinion to add why it is important to quote unquote, pay more than the worth of Shvuyim. I'll end with what I started. They should all come back and very soon. And this was recorded in July of 2024. See you next week.